Hi folks, Pat Healy here from the Laker News. Today I am interviewing King's Hands MP Cody Blois about several to topics concerning the writing, especially the East Hants area. Welcome, Cody. Hi, Pat. Good to see you. And thanks for having us on. And, and let me just say this quickly, if I could. I understand Lino is helping to support a, a series of these videos. Uh, so thank you to Lino and thank you to you, Pat, uh, for your work in, uh, in really promoting local journalism. It's important now more than ever. And uh, tip of the cap to you. Thank you. This video is produced by Daily Media with the support of Lino Stop Shop. All right, Cody, uh, let's uh, get going and thank you for doing this. Over All right. to you. All right. Uh, talk a little bit about 2021 and how it was for King's Hands. Yeah, well, look, uh, I mean, obviously, 2021 was had some bright sides in the sense that you'll recall when we came into the new year, uh, at that point, there really hadn't been a large distribution of vaccines. We were still in that holding pattern of trying to prevent COVID from being in our communities at all. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes it's easy to forget that in a, in a few short months, we were able to roll out uh, vaccines across the country. Uh, obviously, that work continues. We're, we're inching closer to, to 90%. But, um, you know, on that side, it was a good thing in the fact that the government was there. Uh, challenging times. It, it, we've had ups and downs, haven't we, Pat, with the, the waves of the pandemic in the sense that uh, we'll have brief moments of uh, a new normal. Obviously, still some protocols in place, but the ability to travel, the ability to, to get around. And then, of course, as we've seen with Omicron and other waves, uh, a need to try to tighten up a little bit to make sure our healthcare system isn't overwhelmed. So it's been a, it's been a year of up and downs. Uh, very proud of the work that uh, our team has done in King's Hands. Uh, we've got great communities. I always say I'm very privileged to get to represent King's Hands because on the whole, uh, just very proud of the communities that are encompassing in the area. Uh, we obviously had the federal election in uh, in September of last year. Uh, great opportunity for me to be able to try to get around and hear from thousands of people, and uh, and and looking forward to continuing the work, including Parliament, which is ex which is going to return on Monday, uh, January thirty first. Okay, and uh, the child care announcement uh, was recently made. It didn't seem to go over well for the for profit Nova Scotia child care centers until the province of Nova Scotia decided to give a reprieve regarding the date, the deadline. Um, talk a little bit about the child care announcement. Sure. Look, I, I think in some cases it's unfortunate because uh, uh, the entire agreement that we're working on establishing across the country with the provinces and territories is, is really historic in nature. Uh, it's going to help a lot of families and it's going to make child care more affordable writ large uh, for, for families across the country. Uh, I want to delineate, Pat, the difference between what the federal government is uh, expecting of the provinces and territories with, with general broad uh, principles and what the provincial government has chosen to take uh, as an action plan to date. Uh, our goal as a government of Canada is trying to make sure that there's inclusive spaces so families that may have children with higher needs or special needs ha can have access to, to childcare spaces. There's obviously a focus on, on language and making sure that uh, there's francophone seats in the province, indigenous spaces, um, and, and that ultimately the entity in question can be able to get the average price point down to $10 a day. Uh, what the federal government is not requiring is for for-profit organizations to inherently become not-for-profit. Uh, we do have some parameters on the 9,000 additional spaces. So of course, we're not trying to just get the existing spaces down to $10 a day. We wanna create 9,000 new spaces. Uh, we do have parameters of the government of Canada that we our preference is for those spaces to be not-for-profit. Uh, but there's an ability to work with the province uh, if that was something that uh, was going to prove difficult to to roll out. My own personal opinion as a parliamentarian, Pat, is that the province has, has taken an unfortunate step of trying to move everything towards uh, not-for-profit. You've got to remember that of the 200 for-profit organizations, many of these are women entrepreneurs. Uh, many of them are already operating in a system that is highly regulated. Uh, and so the idea that this is a laissez-faire market and you have you know, kind of uh, for-profit operators that are making off with millions of dollars is just simply not the case. And, and what I can't seem to understand is why the provincial government would want to take away the managerial function, right? Right now, we have a lot of childcare spaces, not-for-profit and for-profit. Uh, where you have individuals who are on the ground who are able to assess situations, who are able to make staffing decisions, 
Um, I think there's a lot more to be said about what the province's different options are, but certainly option number two, which was taking a lot of that managerial function away from the operators to a centralized system, which I presume is Child Care Nova Scotia. Um, I think the provincial government is underestimating the value of the managerial function for the owners and operators across the province. And centralizing that, I think, creates a, a bureaucratic uh, challenge that, I, that I, I hope is going to be reconciled. At the end of the day, the other part for for-profit operators is, Pat, let's say you've been in this business. Let's pretend you're Carmi, you're Florence MacArthur, Karen Sampson, others. You, you've built this business over time. And so there's an intrinsic book value uh, to what that represents in the sense that, Pat, you could come to me if you were had been an operator and say, look, Cody, come buy my book of business and come you know, help provide good quality care uh, for, for good quality education, I should say. Uh, that's worth something. And the provincial government hasn't really signaled how they would compensate that. I think if there's an ability to keep the private operators under the regulated system, obviously encourage them and, and ensure that they're going to abide by the federal government principles, which is allowing inclusivity in the seats, being mindful of, of course, admissions that might be, of course, uh, imposed on child by child care Nova Scotia, but allowing them to stay for profit with that federal subsidy uh, would allow them to transfer that equity that they've built up over time before the agreement was in place. So it's hard to say where the Houston government will go. Certainly pleased to see that they've extended the timeline, uh, but I think they have to go back to the board and, uh, and, and take a look at uh, the agreement as it is right now. And, and certainly not the agreement, the action plan that they've developed. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Um, COVID-19 impact, uh, what will uh, Parliament look like for those for this house session with Omicron. Yeah, yeah, so uh, the way it's working and uh, there were some question marks up until a few days ago, um, essentially, for, I'm speaking for the Liberal Party, I can't speak for other yeah. parties, um, but uh, the way it's going to work is essentially we're split into two, this being uh, MPs outside of cabinet. And for example, one week, I will be expected to be in Ottawa participating in person. Uh, in one, the next week, I will be uh, expected to participate virtually, similar to what you and I are doing right now. And so that back and forth will allow me to be able to get to Ottawa to participate, but still keeping in mind that we're not going to have 338 uh, members of Parliament shoulder to shoulder. There's also some provisions around question period, because that's the time generally when the most MPs are in the House uh, to try to make sure that uh, unless you're on a certain House duty schedule, you're not there. Uh, but it's going to allow us to be back in the house. It's I prefer being in Ottawa. Uh, it, it, of course, uh, is nice to have the opportunity to, to do this work virtually if, if I was sick or if, if need be. Um, but there's nothing replaces being there in person. And it, there's nothing that replaces the opportunity to engage with your colleagues and uh, and to have these conversations one on one. And I guess or I gather you're going up Monday. Sure. I'll be uh, yes, I'll be I'll be up on Monday. Uh, I've I've drawn the straw to be up there first. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great to get back. Okay. Uh, speaking of COVID nineteen, what's your take on the Freedom Convoy that left Enfield yesterday, headed for Ottawa? Yeah. Look, I guess a couple things, Pat. I would say to this is um, what I think is getting lost in the conversation around uh, vaccine mandate for for truck drivers is that. Uh, the actual element, uh, Canadian, the Canadian government can not stop Canadians from returning back to the country, whether they're vaccinated or not. What is not being discussed is that it's actually the United States government that is imposing that if you were to enter the country, uh, you have to be double vaccinated. Uh, this, the narrative is getting spun that it's the government of Canada that's preventing truck drivers from driving to the US. That's not the case. Of course, we have a reciprocal policy for any American truck drivers that are coming to Canada that they have to be fully vaccinated. I think the health situation warrants that given the fact that their vaccination status is, is far below where Canada's at. Uh, there's still uh, large outbreaks in the US. And at the end of the day, what we've heard from a lot of the trucking associations is that the supply chain is intact. It is extremely resilient. Is there going to be challenges? Will there be certain shortages? Um, you know, I think that has been borne out. Uh, but, but, but I don't think you're going to see a grocery store with no shelves on it uh, or no food on the shelves, so to speak. And, and really, um, we have to applaud the 90% of truck drivers that would correlate to the average population that have rolled up their sleeve, got the jab. Um, moving more to the actual convoy piece of it, um, I have more sympathy for individuals 
uh, even though I would question, you know, why they might not want to get the vaccine and why they wouldn't follow science. Uh, you know, your average truck driver who might be concerned and want to demonstrate and use their ability to protest. Um, I think that's within their right to do so. But we've seen some of the uh, negative underbelly of some of the folks that are involved in this. And it, I think it's a much more sinister uh, it's a much more sinister objective. It's not just about uh, peaceful demonstration. Uh, there's people, you know, that you've seen on the news calling for civil war. We saw some journalists, frankly, being harassed, being called communists, being called, you know, fake media. Uh, that is the type of rhetoric and concern that I don't think has any place in Canadian society. That is the worrying part of what is uh, undoubtedly headed towards Ottawa. And so, again, um, although I would question the motives all around, more sympathy for those that are doing this um, with, with wanting to demonstrate and less sympathy and actual real concern about those that are trying to undermine our democracy and, and you know, cause civil disruption. Cool. Um, so there's a rumor going around that you're wanting to run for the Nova Scotia Liberal leadership. Um, any truth to that? It, well, look, Pat, I, I appreciate that uh, my name's being floated, uh, and I wouldn't rule something out uh, of that nature in the future. But I, look, at this point, I'm 31. I've been in elected office for just over two years. I, I want to be able to build my skill set. And so, no, on the current uh, leadership track, although I'm very humbled that my name is getting tossed around, uh, there's no intention uh, in that side. Uh, but again, you know, perhaps down the road, if there was an opportunity to come into provincial politics and serve in that capacity, it would be something I'd be open to. But I think I still need to grow and learn and, and become uh, an even better parliamentarian as a member of parliament. And I can do that at the federal level. And uh, that's where my focus is right now. All right. Thanks for the answer. That, that'll clear that up. <laughs> sure. You broke the news here. <laughs> Since uh, COVID-19 has started, the online rhetoric has ramped up, it seems, with more nasty uh, comments and sometimes questionable and threatening comments towards many politicians, including yourself. How do you deal with these messages and how does it impact you? Look, I, I got to be honest with you, Pat. Uh, when I first got elected in 2019, uh, of course, I still had like a personal Facebook account and, and you know, whether it was on the East Hans wants to know or, or whatever East Hans rants and raves, you would just see it out in the, in the community. Um, I quickly learned that that was something I had to tune out. Uh, it's not to say that there's not perhaps important feedback via social media platforms and things of that nature, but um, there's always going to be naysayers uh, and, and you can't let it deter you. That's not to say that you don't care about uh, trying to make sure that you're mindful of the mood of your constituents and that you're meeting that. But if you worry about every Facebook comment and, uh, and every kind of slight towards you, uh, you're not worrying about the right things, which is which is being focused on trying to deliver for constituents, being focused on trying to be in, in contact. The reality is, if someone wants to reach out and have a meaningful conversation, they can do so. They can call our office. And I got to be honest with you, I do do my best to get back to as many people personally, um, whether or not they would necessarily concord with the government's vision or not, as long as it's reasonable, you know, obviously conspiracy yeah. stuff and, and really kind of far flung elements uh, isn't worth my time or, you know, perhaps my constituents. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, you can't take this stuff personally on Facebook. It is, I guess I would say concerning and I I don't want to stereotype, but I know a number of our female co colleagues, particularly, I think back to Lenore Zan, uh, she faced a whole host of online abuse. It's not fair uh, and it's unfortunate. And it, it is uh, perhaps social media has a tremendous benefit of allowing people to express themselves, allowing communities to kind of come together online. Uh, but at the same time, it can be a platform that can also be extremely divisive. So um I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, uh, it kind of does. does it? Does it? Yeah, look, try not to take it personally. Understand that not everyone's going to agree with the perspective of the government or what I do as a member of parliament. Um, but, at, but at the end of the day, do my best to just try to, uh, to, try to you know, forge ahead every day and, and not worry about that stuff. All right. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we're into 2022 now, almost into the second month of 2022. So what does the year look like? ahead look like for King's Hands and yourself. Any projects coming to the area? Sure. Well, uh, look, we'll, we'll obviously have the normal course of, of certain projects that uh, are being advanced to the federal level. 
Um, you know, we've, when I look around, whether you see the Lance interchange, which is, I, I know a very welcome piece of infrastructure for people in the corridor. Um, you know, we just had a very nice announcement that Pat, you were part of in, uh, in North Knoll Road at Finley Park with the amphitheater, the community revitalization fund. Uh, and I'll just speak to that for a moment, uh, was a program that was designed, uh, really that was driven by rural caucus and Atlantic caucus to have a to have a program for not-for-profit organizations that were struggling to be able to do the same level of fundraising activity because of the pandemic restrictions uh, to make sure that they had some funds available to uh, to furnish renovations and upgrades and so I think that you'll see a series of those uh, projects roll out across King's Hands um, obviously right now the municipality we, we had important wastewater investment in Shibanakity their focus right now is on active transportation trails uh, so I you know I don't want to let the cat out of the bag but I suspect you'll see some things on that side um, from a parliamentary sense Pat uh, I sit as the chair of the agriculture committee um, uh, a couple major things that are coming to focus and these are national issues but they impact King's Hands because of our composition um, one is around the Canadian Agriculture Partnership. So this is an agreement that the provinces and territories uh, strike with the federal government for a five-year period. Uh, that is going to be extremely important for setting the foundation for the future of agriculture. That will have a big impact across the riding. Um, obviously, the dairy industry, uh, there have been some impacts to Kusma. We, King's Hance and particularly East Hance is, is home to the highest proportion of dairy farmers uh, east of Quebec. Uh, so those types of agreements that the government will be striking to uh, to compensate and to be mindful of that industry will be important. Um, housing is a big one. Uh, we know across the board uh, in King's Hands, I think it's up upwards of 40 percent uh, home values across the board. This is not just a, a local issue. It's a national issue. But trying to find uh, organizations or municipalities that might take on some of the government of Canada programmings will be an area of focus. Um, seniors, uh, we, we have a lot of seniors that are on fixed income. Some, of course, are in, in better fiscal shape uh, and financial uh, health than others, uh, particularly single seniors. And that was part of the reason why we had a platform commitment uh, to increase the guaranteed income supplement by $500. To me, that's something that we have to get done uh, within the next two years because we know that uh, there are seniors that are struggling on the affordability issue. Um, beyond King's Hands, just speaking, Pat, if, you, if you'll permit yep. me, uh, economic growth, uh, it's extremely important and, and the fiscal health of the country is spending. And I know that, uh, I, look, I think Daryl comes on and he, he's probably going to have a conversation with you if he hasn't already. Um, the government had to be there uh, to make sure that we protected and warded off the worst economic outcomes of the pandemic. I think we've successfully done that. The there's, I think the number last I heard was 107% of the jobs that have been lost at the height of the pandemic have been returned. Actually, now the challenge is, is, the, is the labor capacity. There's 900,000 unfilled jobs in this country. Part of that is due to our demographic track, where we have an aging baby boomer demographic that are, is, 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 is heading towards retirement. At the same time, uh, we have to focus on immigration. We have to focus on automation. Some of those jobs, uh, frankly, uh, perhaps can be replaced with innovative technologies uh, that can create uh, really good jobs as a result. And so that's where I think the government has to put its focus. The economic growth will grow the revenue opportunities to help get us back to, uh, to close that deficit and to make sure that we're reasonable in the days ahead as we've taken on a lot, uh, I think, which has been responsible to date. All right. Uh, you were recently announced to be the chair of the Liberal Atlantic Caucus and chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food. What do these roles entail so residents can have a better understanding of the work you're doing? Sure, good question. Um, there is, uh, when we are in Ottawa, uh, there is 159 Liberal MPs. Uh, and of course the Conservatives, this would I think generally mirror all the parties. Um, when we are in Ottawa, we would break into different caucuses. So uh, Quebec caucus, Liberal caucus, the MPs that reside in a certain region, uh, we have an Atlantic Liberal Caucus, which is uh, comprised of 24 members from the four different Atlantic provinces. Uh, and when we come together at a national caucus, all Liberal MPs, uh, each regional caucus, there's five of them, 
have the opportunity to present for four minutes to the prime minister and to cabinet. Uh, as the Atlantic caucus chair, I now get to be the one that has to present for four minutes on behalf of my colleagues from the Atlantic, and of course, help facilitate uh, our advocacy and our work as a, as, as a united caucus on the Atlantic side. Uh, that's what that work looks like there. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, engage with stakeholders to try to bring the voice of our colleagues and to be a good representative within, uh, within the, the government caucus. Uh, the agriculture committee chair is uh, is different. It's parliamentary in the sense that it, we in the House of Commons have a series of committees where parliamentarians will sit and the numbers on the committee reflect the actual number of uh, MPs that sit in the House. So we're in a minority situation, as you know now, Pat. So there are... Um, there are six uh, Liberal members of Parliament that will sit on the Agriculture Committee. There are four Conservatives, an NDP member, and a Bloc Quebecois member. Of that, the government party has the ability to chair the committee. I was fortunate enough to be the chair, and so now my role is to help administer and, uh, and to uh, conduct meetings for the Agriculture Committee. The role of the committee is essentially to study things that, uh, that members think might be important and to be able to provide recommendations back to the government to improve processes and, and policies. So, for example, uh, it looks as though our first study as an agriculture committee will be focused on the impacts of the supply chain and how that's uh, impacting agri processors and, of course, farmers themselves, and what recommendations and policies the government can put in place to try to address those. So, a very important role. Look, uh, I, I think uh, I think all parliamentarians would say whether or not it's in the house or on committees. Uh, I, I think committees is where the rubber hits the road. Great opportunity to engage with colleagues. Um, depending on the nature of the committee, they can be quite collaborative and, and agriculture has been one where most of the people on the committee are quite focused on the needs of farmers and every party is going to have their own partisan position on certain things The members will have their own ideas. Um, but generally it's a quite collaborative committee that does not uh, become kind of uh, uh, very controversial or very uh, kind of entrenched uh, political positions. Cool. Um, anything else you'd like to add? No, just look, uh, very pleased to be able to come on and join. Uh, looking forward to 2022. There's a lot of work that has to get done. I think uh, the focus of the government will be to try to get to the other side of Omicron, try to get back to some sense of, of, of a return to normal. Uh, we see around the world uh, countries trying to say we have to live with COVID. And I, I suspect whether it be some of the provincial governments in the hearing from people like Dr. Strang and otherwise, that's the goal. Uh, and then the focus will be what are some other key priorities like climate change, uh, reconciliation, economic growth that I've talked about, those are going to be the kind of the bread and butter issues uh, beyond the management of the pandemic that uh, all parliamentarians will be focused on. Uh, but keep up the great work, Pat. And I guess I would just say to anyone that's listening, if you ever have a question or concern, just reach out to our office. We've got a great team and we're more than happy to help. Thank you very much, Cody, for taking some time for us here at the Laker News on this uh, Friday morning. Also, thank you to Daily Media for this video production with the support of Lino Stop Shop in Emsdale. From the Laker News Home Office in Enfield, Pat Healy, wishing you all a great day. Stay safe and be kind.